So, good morning, Comrade Justin. Yes, morning, <laughs> morning, Comrade. <laughs> I wanted to share something that I found with you. It's not gin, but it should be, because. Ooh, it is. A I like that skull head vodka. Watch out, Harrison Ford is going to be busting through there as Indiana Jones to to nab that. How sad is it? that we both thought the same thing. <laughs> Our first look at a crystal skull full of vodka, and what do we think? Indiana Jones. Right, I There's mean. There's something wrong. How did you feel about that one, too? Did you see the the fourth one? I was so disappointed. I know, Shia LaBeouf swinging from vines with a bunch of primates. No thank you. You know, no thanks. what made me really, really sad, though, I mean, really tragically angrily sad wait isn't there no I'm, swangry is sweaty and angry Sway, sw what's what's swangry? sad and angry yeah that's that's one of um of jessica's uh she was swangry i get swangry in humidity oh my god but there needs to be one for sad and angry sangry yeah. just doesn't work either way the important thing is <coughs> Uh, Marion. The first Indiana Jones movie worked so well in a huge part because Marion, five feet two, was so feisty and smart and funny yeah. and just as clever as he was and all of that. And then the second movie, which will not be named, was so appallingly bad in large part because the female sidekick, who I know is Steven Spielberg's wife and everything, and I'm not going to comment on that, but I am going to say she blew it. Along with the, the violence against children thing, which crossed Ooh. a line, I think it's not fun if kids are getting hurt. Um, you know, then it becomes a horror film. But the they never really got uh, got the girl right ever again after Marion. And seeing them bring Karen Allen back, I was like, yes, they understand. It's all about Marion. It's uh, all about feisty. It's all about... And she was whiny and shrill and obnoxious. And I thought, I feel so bad for Karen Allen. Because if you look at her work, like her actual acting work outside of Indiana Jones, she is neither shrill nor whiny. She is Marion. And so my heart broke. And I thought, oh. You know, the one franchise that actually got it right, and it was tricky to do, National Treasure. Uh. <laughs> because they kept the girl for the sequel. They switched it up. They had to. But they kept the girl. And then, or the next one, it was not only Don't Forget the Girl, because she worked and we liked her, but it was also And Don't Forget to Bring Your Parents. Because yep. they had Helen Mirren and John Voight show up. These are important lessons that franchises needed <laughs> need to learn and accept. Don't forget the girl. Bring your parents. Resourceful people we are, said Yoda. Um, never mind, but yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> the look on your face said it all. <laughs> I, we're we're not going to go there right now. Um, I I could go off about Nicolas Cage for a while. So. Oh yeah. Well, maybe maybe we. Oh, need like more. in a good, just a strange way, not like negative. He's a kind of an interestingly strange guy. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, one of the movies he would never ever be able to be in would be 1984. I don't think so, especially given the. Uh, some of the descriptions of the just the people yeah, in 1984 fit. land that we'll see in this chapter. Yeah, yeah. In this chapter, did it, did, did it ring North Korea bells for you? Uh, yeah, a little bit. And then also, in a weird way, sort of Snowpiercer, the movie. Um, oh, yeah. Kind of like once they get to the front, although even, I mean, that's kind of kids, but just that kind of the oiliness of things and the repetition of <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. uh-huh right that's a good one to check out though if um yeah. you're into 
dystopia. It's a weird dystopia. It is a weird dystopia. It is like unlike any dystopia I have seen Microcosmic, before. I guess, almost, which is yeah. the point of it. Yeah. Yeah. When you when you distill it all. Well, and actually, interesting that, that we bring this one up, because in some ways, uh, there are some very clear parallels between that uh, forced microcosm, you know, this, this tiny community of uh, collectively miserable people who appear to all be miserable in the same way for the same reasons, which is kind of not true, uh, and where Winston is. Yeah. The, the weird part with when 1984 is having the pearls there, and that's I think that's going to get progressively stranger as we go along through um, through the rest of the book. But were there were there any things that you thought um, people should be aware of before diving into chapter five? Uh, there was a word or two maybe that I looked up because I didn't exactly. I mean, in context, I kind of figured it out, but. Um, I don't think are used a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Um, it would have helped if I wrote it down. I think it's a panikin. Yes. I was going to look that one up and then I thought, oh, maybe not. It's just like, uh, like a cup or bowl for drinking. It's pretty much. For drinking though. I think so. Let me, let me double check that. That's very interesting because that's what they were served their stew in. Yeah, uh -huh. a small metal drinking cup. Interesting. Noun. Yep. And I mean, personally, I use I've got this awesome Kurt Vonnegut coffee mug with a bunch of quotes on. I love it. And that. I drink coffee out of it, but I also will eat like yogurt and granola out of it too. Well, yeah. Cause why not? Yeah, usually not one right after the other. <laughs> And <laughs> for all, all sorts I probably of wash them, yeah, <laughs> most of the time anyway. I'm not sure if so much of that's happening in uh, mm -mm. the canteen Winston's at. But no, it feels way, any... way grimier than... Very grimy. Yeah. So much grime. Uh, it's almost like the party found some sort of cleaning solution that was like grease and really easy to produce or is like a byproduct of making you know, bombs and missiles and they just like spray it all over the metallic trays and stuff instead of actually using soap and water. That's so horrifying. <laughs> I know, it sounded terrible. Um, uh, but yes. other than that, I can't think of too much that really yeah, would uh, jar anyone out if the story if they didn't understand no. a word too. There were... There were um, we got a couple of comments on uh, Patreon from Lise, who did the um, politics and the English language with me last week. And I wanted to read her two comments um, and encourage people to, again, phone in. They can use area code 206-350-1642, or they can write to us, uh, bravenewpodcast at gmail.com with comments, or leave comments on the Patreon website which is patreon.com slash brave new podcast and um and that way they can talk to each other for one thing and also with us and so this is um i think chapter three because she wrote this on may 11th yes uh so lee said talking about winston's clothing the visual of him being in a jumpsuit like a factory worker i think this is a completely deliberate visual just like the industry factory worker does a repetitive job that requires little thinking, Winston is categorized as such in a non-description of clothing. We're told that O'Brien and the scarlet-sashed woman are both in overalls and you only assume that Winston is similarly attired. O'Brien is singled out by being described in black overalls and the girl with her scarlet sash. You already know Winston is not a high official, an important person, or even someone whose opinion would be valued. He's a non-person. He is a worker bee. He's a drone, if you will. He has so little value that his clothing is unimportant. We know he carries a briefcase because he stuffed the diary in it, and we assume that all workers in his position carry a briefcase. The workers are all interchangeable. As a cog in a factory, so the workers themselves can be changed out. Currently, Winston's defiant act of journaling is the only distinguishing act that we've seen. We know he's done others. He bought the pen and ink, set up the desk in a non-visual corner. But we have no idea of what has brought him to these crimes. We don't know how he thinks yet. We understand he's oppressed 
and he internally rages against it. We do not understand Winston's motives yet, but we already align with him. We take it for granted that he would want the non-visual corner and the diary. If we don't understand the oppressive atmosphere that he lives in, we cannot understand how huge these minor freedoms actually are. How is this going to impact his future? How does this reflect his internal struggle? Why is there an internal struggle at all? He is so downtrodden, what actually motivates him in his defiance? And I think we're going to start to see answers to those questions, those excellent questions. Um, yeah. The begin the beginning of answers in today's um, today's episode. And I actually want...